one of the prominent characters in our book is based on a real person by the name of Larry Glazer. Larry was a friend of my girlfriend's younger brother. But this guy was savvy. He had been out in the world and he was a cool guy and he knew all about getting about. In fact, he had been to Europe and had been to Israel and other places, even though he was several years younger than me and I had been nowhere. So Larry one day came up and we had a big chat about what was going on in the world and how I was going to do this travel and everything. And he actually had with him directions of how to get from Istanbul to Kathmandu, Nepal for about $22, including student fairs, where you got your visas, all this kind of thing. And Larry had this thing all written out. And he said, well, let me give you some of this information. Those days you couldn't have copying machines and things of that sort 50 years ago, it wasn't that way. And Larry actually took a piece of small loose leaf paper and he hand wrote on that sheet the directions, he copied it from the directions he had, which were handwritten from somebody else. And he gave me that recipe, that formula, that treasure map. And when he gave it to me, I took it and I wrote on it to Nepal. One of the amazing parts of my journey is that eventually, after I had been traveling 11 months and more, I wound up running into my friend Larry Glazer in Kandahar, Afghanistan. It's an incredible part of the journey. And eventually, I wind up seeing him on television him in, in Austria several weeks later. So there was a, some incredible coincidences around Larry. But Larry really fired me up. He gave me the key to the door, but he also gave me the encouragement that I needed to make a travel of this sort, even a possibility at that time, even though it was something I maybe wanted to always do, it wasn't something I really thought I was gonna do. But that directional map, that step-by-step -step how to get from here to there was very critical to my travel. And it made things a lot of fun and Larry was a very big part of it. I believe Larry has passed away. I would love to see him. I can't seem to find any of my old compatriots from the trail, except for one, Marshall in Florida. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Manhattan, New York City. Yes, that was really my first stop on my travel. I left home took a $16 one-way flight on American Airlines, and I flew to Manhattan, LaGuardia. I had a friend there that I visited with, but at one point, I was on the road. It was no visiting friends. It was being let loose. And I returned to New York City, and I started my real travel. I walked around New York with my backpack on my back, and I found the Air Icelandic office and I paid $118 and I had like a day hanging around Manhattan, looking around, walking around. And at one point I was over near the New York Public Library, the main library, which is an incredible institution and a real icon. And I'm in front of the library and I see a guy, he's in those days, we called them bums. These were not the kind of guys that walked around India like sadhus. This is like a poor old guy who had no home and was in New York City just being a bum. And he sees me and he goes, oh man, he's sitting there rubbing his feet. He's on a park bench and he's got his shoes up. He goes, you know, you should never steal a man's shoes. My feet are killing me. I thought that was pretty funny, but it was pretty crazy. Eventually, I became a man without shoes. And that's part of the story here that we're gonna tell. And I know some people walked around forever without shoes, but for me, really a city boy, to walk around barefoot was not where I wanted to be. And I didn't steal shoes. But New York City in those days was really a very savage place. It became very gentrified and fancy. I'm talking Manhattan over the years, now all of Manhattan basically, in spite of the pandemic and stuff. It's still a great place and it's all polished and shined. In those days, it was rough. If you walked the wrong way, you'd see a squeegee guy. 
These are the men who would go out there and wash people's uh, windshields, wipe them down, and then try to hit them up for money. And it was all kinds of depravity. Rats were running around. But it was the beginning of my travel. And I had that time to kill. Travel, like many other things, is a situation where sometimes it's very boring. And other times it starts to get real interesting and scary. But New York City and Manhattan was a place to reckon with. And I loved it, but it was scary too. I liked the fearful part of the travel about the unknown. That was something that beckoned to me. And New York City was a big part of that, of the beginning of facing the world and being a wanderer, being a walker, being a hitchhiker and setting off to do my thing. The travel over was a thrill. I had never crossed an ocean. And because I bought that really cheap flight, $118, that's about as cheap as you can get, on Air Icelandic loft lighter air, it was a propeller plane. That's pretty crazy, but it's true. Four propellers, and we got out in New York City, and we flew to Reykjavik, Iceland. And we got off to let the Icelandic people off, to let Icelandic people come on to go to Europe, and for those that were going to Iceland for tourist type purposes or other business purposes. And I just hung out in the airport for a couple few hours. I think they refueled the plane. And I got back on and it was a very lyrical, lovely flight, kind of boring, no big deal, but it landed me in Luxembourg. And Luxembourg was really an out of the way place. It was not a place I wanted to travel to, but it was a cheap place. And I get off that flight and it's like, Hmm. this is not where I want to be, but the customs people, they attached on to me and I was looking wild, long red curly hair, shaggy beard, grubby, and they made me buy a ticket for $118 to return, even though the people in New York said, you don't need a round trip ticket. They were not going to let me in their country. Squirrely looking guy that I was, backpack, degenerate type they thought, without a return ticket. Well, that return ticket took a serious dent out of my pocket. I only started with 500 bucks. Here I was 118 there, spending time in New York, another 118, I'm down to a couple hundred bucks and I'm a long ways from home. Of course, I did have that ticket, but I didn't want to use it because I certainly didn't want to go back to Luxembourg again. My first day in Luxembourg was kind of boring. It isn't really a great place to visit. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's European and it looks you know, old and cool in some ways, but it wasn't what I wanted. And I wanted to find a youth hostel because I wanted to be living the cheap way. I wanted to stay for a long time. I only had a couple hundred dollars and a ticket to return home. So I looked for a youth hostel, I had a directory, found an address, Hailed around with some people, some Luxembourg residents who were kind of hip folks that had been to the U.S., things of that sort. And we finally find the address of the youth hostel. It had been demolished. So now I'm like, oh, what do I do? Well, I find a place, I think it was called Wimpy's or something, and it looked like a McDonald's, except for one thing. The hamburgers stunk, but they had beer. This was the beginning of a whole new world. McDonald's in the USA still do not have alcohol. But it was a different world in Europe, and alcohol, beer, wine, other things was a big part of it. So I had my lousy meal and finally found a place for about three bucks, way more than I wanted to spend. I spent that night in that feather bed. It was cold, had a, I think just a sink in the room, bathroom down the hall, it was a cheap place. But guess what? That trip over, you know, I forgot how it gets you going, gets you zonked out. You know, I had you know, the travel dizziness, you know, the uh, jet lag, and I didn't wake up the next day. In fact, I didn't wake up till one o'clock. What was it, 1 p.m.? Bang, 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 bang. Mr. Mr. Leave, you got to leave the room, Mr. Mr. Whoa. So that was the end of my first day in Europe, jet lag and all, and I got up late to hit the road because I sure didn't want to stay 
in Luxembourg. So I hit the road from Luxembourg and I'm trying to get to Amsterdam. Now this is supposed to be the cool place. Everybody wants to go to Amsterdam. It's the hippie Mecca. And that's where I wanted to get to because I'm Mr. Hippie, Mr. Cool, at least so I think. So how am I gonna get there? I'm gonna hitchhike. I'm gonna hitchhike to Brussels. Well, that didn't work out real well. It took me hours to get a ride. I actually did make it. I made it by getting in with a trucker. And this guy, he could hardly speak English and hardly speak French. He spoke the regular Flemish languages of the area. And he stopped off. We had a couple few beers together. Now that was something different. I finally do get into Brussels, another big European city, but it's not till late in the day. Brussels is a booming town, but it's boring to me. I need Amsterdam. So I walk around and thinking, no, I don't really feel like going into some fancy hotel. This is gonna cost me a fortune. I'm gonna be a real itinerant, a real traveler, not a tourist. So I find myself after going through the grand city of Brussels, I find a little park and I find a park bench. And I said, I'll just sleep on this park bench. I'll get out my sleeping bag. It was cold, it was wet, it was yucky, and it was fall. It's October the 5th and the nuts are falling from the trees, acorns, who the hell knows, all night long, clunk, clunk, clunk. Well, not much of a sleep. I get up the next day and I go like, you know what? This is too much. I gotta get to Amsterdam. I gotta go or I gotta go. And I buy myself a train ticket. And that was my way out of Brussels. That was my first week on the road 50 years ago that ended up with that night in Brussels. Next week starts out with a train ride to Amsterdam through the Dutch countryside and the incredible exposure to the exploding culture of Amsterdam, the hippie Mecca Center, with people coming and going from parts known and unknown, and the exotic scene in the streets of Amsterdam in the old city with the canals like behind me. Come and join us next week for a great time in the streets of Amsterdam. As I scurry down the hotel steps and out the lobby door into the main streets of tiny Luxembourg, I see the regular hustle and bustle of, ev of everyday life. Street vendors, people busy going to and fro, the steady street traffic. I continue walking down the sidewalk, my backpack on my back and my wild red hair blowing everywhere. As I near the outskirts of town, the sidewalk disappears as I continue walking on the side of the road. I stick my thumb out to hitchhike. Many motorists pass me by. Some of the bewildered looks I'm getting from the natives brand me with that stereotyped American hippie stare. I hope this isn't a sign of how things will always be on this wandering journey. We shall see. Finally, a big blue truck pulls to the side of the road. I run to catch up. As I walk over to the driver's side door, a big beefy man emerges. His huge ham hand swallows mine in a handshake. Hello, I'm Steve. Thank you for picking me up. The man speaks some Flemish mixed with French, but he mostly grunts and groans as he waves me to get in on the passenger side. We can't understand each other, but we can communicate through gestures, pointing, head nods, and a few words I can make out. He's a very friendly man who laughs and smiles a lot. I think I look funny to him because of my hair. His name is Henri as he shows me a picture ID with his name as we continue down the road heading for Brussels. Just before the border, Henri pulls off the main road and heads to a little pub nearby. We go inside a small dive that only has a couple other customers. We each pull up a stool to the bar. He buys me a mug of beer and we have a drink together. Smiling, laughing, pointing, we communicate mostly with our eyes and facial expressions. Henri is a generous, good-natured fellow. It's so surreal not being able to communicate with others through the English language, but we manage to communicate with more than just the spoken word. We each down our mug of beer. Then Henri motions to me to go. We leave the bar and get in Henri's truck to head for the Belgian border. I'm ready. We cross into Belgium without incident. 
Henri has a delivery to make outside of town, so he drops me off in downtown Brussels. <laughs> 